All right, so in our next section, we're going to talk about codecs, coder decoders. Uh, we've already talked briefly about what the, the purpose of a codec is. We talked about quantization, the, the process of converting a pulse amplitude modulated signal to a pulse code modulated signal or some other variant of digital signal that might exist so that we can transmit our data in K, inside of a digital packet. Uh, so what we want to do now is maybe take a look at some of the considerations for some of the code and take a look at what the impact is of choosing a particular codec, particularly when it comes to transmitting our information over the WAN or over slower speed uh, uh, connections. All right. So we will take a look at that. So what is pulse code modulation? Uh, we sample the analog signal. We talked about Nyquist theorem, right? Sample at twice the highest frequency. We talked about that 4,000 hertz or 4 kilohertz frequency uh, that we're dealing with with uh, a human perceptible speech, uh, especially on a phone call, right, or in a typical voice conversation. We quantize the sample, right? What was the idea of quantization? Quantization is the idea of taking those samples using that quantization scale with the steps and the segments, the linear segments and the uh, uh, logarithmic, uh, excuse me, the logarithmic segments and the linear steps to be able to identify uh, an 8-bit pattern for each one of those particular samples, right? We encode that value into a binary uh, expression uh, and then we compress the samples. If we want to, we can have uncompressed codecs and of course we can have compressed codecs as well. Uh, basically the idea is that we're, what we're doing here is we're trying to digitally represent some sort of sampled analog waveform. Uh, and uh, PCM is, pulse code modulation is, is, is the primary method that we use. You could also do LPCM, linear pulse code modulation, uh, but the quantization levels in LC, uh, LPCM uh, are not uh, quite as good because we do linear uh, representation or uniform representation of the quantization scale. All right. We also talked about sampling. We talked about uh, uh, quantizing to the nearest uh, value range within those digital steps uh, and so on. What are some of the issues that we see with quantization? Right. We see quantization error. By definition, what is quantization error? What is quantization error? It's basically a rounding error, yeah. It's basically the idea, not, not only the gaps between the samples, right, because we're only doing 8,000 samples per second, but also the gaps on the steps and the segments, you know, as we're trying to represent each one of those samples in, uh, in some sort of digital format. All right, so we sample, and uh, the book says here, 0 to 4 kilohertz. Uh, Nyquist theorem states that we're going to go ahead and sample at twice the highest frequency, which is 8,000 samples per second. We're then going to quantize that sample, uh, eight segments. Uh, it's actually, I guess technically it's eight if you count zero, right? So the, 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 the horizontal axis is the zero point on the scale, and then we have seven um, individual uh, segments, uh, which are separated logarithmically, uh, so very close together towards the zero point of the scale and further together at, or further apart as you move up the scale. And then we have the linear uh, segments. Uh, those are our 16 intervals, so that gives us a 4-bit value, right? The segments are not equally spaced, but they're uh, finest near the origin. Uh, and I, I documented this and I described this in one of your earlier lessons. Uh, why was that? What was the reasoning for making the steps, or excuse me, the segments closer together. Yeah, most of the data in your speech is going to happen at the lower frequencies. So you're going to see more data on the, on, the, and on the lower amplitudes and the lower frequencies of the pulse amplitude modulated signal than at the higher end of the signal. So we're going to, in order to ensure that we're having, that we have, uh, in essence, uh, a better representation of the digitized sample, we're going we're gonna, to uh, put those steps closer together, or the segments closer together uh, 
uh, on the, towards the zero point of the scale so that we have less quantization error on those lower frequencies and uh, where we have the more data. We quantize the sample, like I said, and then we encode the data into an 8-bit digital form. So we're going to have one bit that represents the positive side of the scale or the negative side of the scale, and that's going to depend on the compounding method that you use, whether it's A law or mu law. Uh, and then we have three bits that represent the segments. Uh, because there's eight segments, we need three bits to represent the segments. And then we have four bits that represent the steps. Uh, because there are 16 steps, we need two to the power of four to represent the individual steps. And again, optionally, we have the ability to, um, to compress the, the uh, uh, signal if we're using a, complex, uh, a more complex codec. So again, sampling is based on the idea of Nyquist theorem, which states that we're going to sample at twice the highest frequency. That PAM signal, that pulse amplitude modulated signal, that's our output waveform, uh, that the analog waveform, if you will, of our speech. Uh, and for us to be able to have an acceptable level of quality for the digital signal that's going to be reconstructed, so we're doing the coding on one side, we're doing the decoding on the other side, so that we're not losing information in between, we need to make sure that we sample at, enough, at a high enough frequency. Uh, and again, based on Harry Nyquist, the mathematical proof that uh, you know, the rate at which the waveform can be sampled so that it represents essentially the original source uh, is that when you want to sa uh, sample a signal, uh, uh, instantaneously sample that signal at twice the highest frequency and that will provide you uh, an adequate representation of, uh, you know, a digital representation of the audio uh, of the converted sample. All right. So, uh, you know, we don't need to get into the specifics of Nyquist theorem, of course. Uh, you know, the book does go into it a little bit more. It talks about narrow band frequencies and wide band frequencies and super wide band frequencies. But uh, in our case, uh, you know, if we're dealing with music, which in some cases we are, right? Some cases we're dealing with music uh, when we're, say, for example, dealing with music on hold. Uh, you can't really use a G729 codec to encode music on hold. It sounds horrible um, because you don't, well, even G711 doesn't sound great, but it's certainly much better than G729, all right? Can you give me the twice the frequency? Some of those packets are going to be essentially the same. Right? No, we're not. Or some of the information you send is going to be negative. No, you are not sampling the same signal twice. You're sampling at twice the highest frequency. So let's say, for hey, example, sir. yes, sir. Can you, can you repeat his question? We couldn't hear it. Uh, his question was, uh, if I'm sampling at twice the rate, then I'm duplicating information, right? Did I paraphrase that correctly? That's not what sampling means. Sampling means I'm taking the waveform and I'm slicing it up into pieces. Those individual pieces are being digitized. So if I have more slices, that's going to result in more data, but it's going to result in a better representation of the original waveform. So if you look at this, the red lines represent the sample points. See what I'm saying? So it's actually less data, not more data. Okay, yeah. Because so, yeah. you're sampling here, you're skipping this Correct. information, Correct. and you're sampling here. Correct. So, so that makes sense by the diagram. Right. What's throwing me off is, okay. So, so they're saying essentially if the highest frequency is 4 kilohertz, in order to, Harry Nyquist said, in order to generate a digital output that is representative of the analog waveform sample at twice the highest frequency, right? So 8,000 samples per second. That's why when you download audio files, uh, sometimes they're going to be encoded at 128K. That's 128,000 samples per second. 
or a, a 192K, 192,000 samples per second. The 192,000 samples per second digital output is going to be higher fidelity than the 128,000 samples per second. It might not be perceptible to you, to the human ear, maybe. If you're an audiophile and you have really expensive headphones, you might be able to tell the difference. But you get the idea. The more samples you can create, the closer those samples are together and the more representative they are going to be of the actual analog waveform. All right? But there's a trade-off, right? What's the trade-off? Processing time, bandwidth, because each sample has to be encoded and transmitted, file size. So 128K MP3 is going to be much smaller than 192K MP3, that kind of thing. Okay? All right. So over time, yes, we've had codecs that have been developed. Uh, they, they do operate at higher sampling rates. Uh, they give you much more uh, precise speech transmission. Uh, but, and they'll operate in a full band range that's, that's, you know, typical for like live music or even, uh, you know, uh, digital quality music that you're rendering and so on. But, you know, we're talking on the phone. We're having a conversation. The most important thing is that I get to deliver my message. You know, my message is clear and concise. It doesn't matter if it's a little fuzzy. It doesn't matter if, if you can hear a little bit of background noise. As long as you can hear my message, that's what's important, right? Uh, so we're trying to balance the uh, uh, balance this the, the 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 quality of the signal with the amount of bandwidth that's being generated, or the amount of, of information that's being generated through the process of of code, encoding that information. So here's that scale that we talked about the segments and the steps. The segments are the, the, they don't have them all listed here. There's actually, it goes all the way up to segment seven on the top end and all the way down to segment seven on the bottom end. Uh, but you'll notice that the steps are much closer together at the lower end uh, and then they start to disperse. They're much further apart at the higher end. Uh, and that's because the segment scale is, is logarithmic. It's not linear. Uh, that's what the LPCM, uh, LPCM encoding is linear encoding, which, where the segments and the steps are all linear, um, and so on. So you also see the companding options, mu law and a law. We don't really need to get into the specifics of mu law and a law in this particular case. Um, it just happens to be how uh, the, the the compression scheme that's used by the codec itself. Uh, and so on, but uh, A-Law is something that's going to be primarily used in Europe uh, and the rest of the world. Uh, and Mu-Law is, or you know, the little micro U symbol, Mu-Law is what we're going to use in the United States uh, and Japan, right? North America and Japan uses Mu-Law because we're awesome. And Mu stands for the United States of America, all right? <laughs> so it's easy to remember in that regard. So quantization divides uh, that pulse amplitude modulated signal. Uh, and then if you think about it, it makes perfect sense, right? The scale represents the binary output. Top of the scale, bottom of the scale represents a zero or one, depending on the companding method that you use. The segments represent, because there's eight of them, starting at zero, so technically really seven, uh, but zero is an inclusive value, because uh, we can sample at the zero point, but that's a three-bit value. And then our segments, our, our steps, excuse me, our steps are the linear steps. There's 16 of them, which is a 4-bit value. So if you add all that up, that's an 8-bit value. All right? And by the way, since we're doing 8,000 samples per second times 8 bits, that's 64 kilobits per second. And that's what a typical DS0 represents, 64K circuit. Uh, so it, it works out perfectly. Uh, in, um, in the world of voice because, you know, we're able to, to uh, essentially duplicate or replicate what we had in the traditional TDM world where we had a DS0 that was 64K of bandwidth. All right, so uh, the, the positive scale, the negative scale, and so on. The x-axis and the y-axis uh, allows me to represent uh, t as t time over the x-axis and the y-axis represents the quantization scale itself. All right, 
Uh, and, and again, A law and mu law is just the audio compression schemes. Uh, those are specifically uh, defined in ITUT G711 uh, that take a 16-bit uh, linear PCM data uh, and, and move that down to eight bits of logarithmic data. Uh, a law, again, like I said, is the standard that we're primarily going to use in Europe and the rest of the world, and mu law in North America and the United States. All right. Yes, exactly. All right. They're very similar to each other. There are a few differences that make them completely incompatible. Uh, so if uh, an international connection uses a law, there has to be some sort of mu law to a law conversion in order for us to communicate. Yeah, there's no thing to convert. Well, codex. Oh, okay. That's what a codec does, right? Codec is not only converts from one uh, uh, compression or or coding algorithm, but it also allows us to change the companding uh, method as well. All right. So here's your, your uh, nine bit words, if you will. Uh, it's really eight bits, honestly, right? I don't know where they're getting the nine bit word definition from, but positive or negative, uh, which by the way changes depending on the companding method, but mu law, mu law uh, one is a positive, zero is a negative, uh, meaning on the top end of the scale or the bottom end of the scale, the segment is the next three bits and the interval, which is the steps, uh, are the last four bits, all right? So we've got this base 10 number that's going to ultimately get converted to binary. The output of the encoding is obviously a binary uh, expression, either as a 1 or a 0. So after we take our, our PAM signal, we generate the samples. That's our analog input waveform. By the way, where does this happen in a Cisco voice world? Where does this encoding occur? At the phone. The phone. When you're talking into the handset, you're generating that pulse amplitude modulated signal. The output of the phone is digital, right? It's network, it's IP. So the codecs are built into the phone and they're the ones that are performing this transaction. All right. So we have our analog input that's going into the handset. The next step is to encode those samples so that we can transmit them over our network and that process is called pulse code modulation. You'll see the PCM represented in a lot of different places. All right, that's basically the step that allows us to convert uh, that PAM signal that we've sampled uh, into some sort of binary expression, right? Uh, 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 plus 127 to a minus 127, subtracting, of course, the sign. Uh, so they're talking about, in that particular case, only the last seven bits represent the actual PCM signal. All right. So at this stage, uh, uh, we're doing the companding as well. Uh, that's where we might compress the analog signal uh, and then expand it back into its original analog waveform on the other side once it reaches its destination. All right. The whole process itself is generally referred to as pulse code modulated signaling or pulse code modulated coding. All right, and a DSP, a digital signal processor, is the device that actually does this. Uh, DSPs were, forgive me if I'm misspeaking, but I'm pretty sure this is accurate, uh, were invented in the United States. Uh, Texas Instruments, I believe, was the first company to develop this technology. I know that there are other DSP manufacturers now but if you've ever provisioned a Cisco uh, solution, you know that DSPs are like bricks of gold, right? Uh, an ISR router might cost you $1,200, and then the DSPs will cost you $4,000. Um, for some reason, they're very, very expensive. But uh, that price may have come down a little bit, but I I'm pretty sure that that's still the case. All right. So we start to look at some different codecs. We have different codecs that we can compare. Uh, these are some of the more common codecs. G711, that's our, our, um, our basic codec. A basic meaning non-complex. Uh, a simple codec because there's no compression uh, and it generates a 64 kilobit per second stream. Uh, about 80 kilobits per, per second with overhead. 
uh, 50 packets per second, about 160 bytes of payload. If you do the math, you can kind of calculate all that stuff. But because again, keep in mind, Cisco, uh, other vendors might do this differently, but Cisco samples at 20 milliseconds per, per packet. So we're not actually encapsulating one second of data each time. We're only encapsulating 20 milliseconds of information, uh, which if you do the math uh, with eight bits uh, per sample, 8,000 samples per second, 20 milliseconds, it's, uh, it's gonna end up being about 160 bytes uh, with overhead, okay? Um, and uh, there may be some calculations on the test that you have to do. G722, 48K codec, 56K codec, or 64K codec. ILBC, 15.2, 15.3. Uh, G729, 8K. Opus is anywhere from 6 to 510K. Uh, never used Opus, never even seen where Opus is used. Traditionally in a Cisco environment, two different codecs that we use, G711 and G729. There are others as well. Right, G723, I think, is even mentioned on the exam. Yeah, yeah, and, the yeah G... In the official yeah, Cisco documentation. yeah. Uh, but 723 is a Cisco-supported codec, and it actually is, is less bandwidth than a, than a 729 codec. It's 5.3K, all right? Well, there's a couple of variation, variants for, for 723, all right? So uh, uncompressed digital speech signals, they're going to be sampled at 8,000 samples per second. Each sample, of course, is 8 bits, as we saw previously. So you're going to have in an uncompressed codec 64 kilobits per second per call. Uh, and then uh, different algorithms uh, allow us to uh, do what we call compression. The way uh, that I understand how the compression works is it's actually kind of like a dictionary. Uh, I forget the specific term that they use to describe it, but they create a dictionary of, of bit patterns. Uh, so they say, for example, if I see a 01001, I'm going to represent that as a 011. So whenever I see a 011, I always know that that's a 01011. So they've got this kind of dictionary, and they can take common strings or common patterns and then replace them with uh, shorter patterns. But again, you, you would lose information there, right? because you can't represent every single pattern because then it would be just the original pattern. So I'm not quite sure how that works specifically, uh, but I have a, uh, I do recall reading uh, in the past documentation about how the G729 compression algorithm works. Uh, and I think that was, that was the way that it worked, but don't quote me on that, okay? So obviously our concern when we're choosing a codec, uh, because you know, Quite honestly, and this, this actually applies to a lot of different principles in voice uh, or video, uh, a lot of people would say, well, why would I ever use, if G729 is uh, toll quality, it's got a mean, mean opinion score of 3.92, so that's near toll quality, why would I ever use anything else, right? Why would I use G711 over G729? The quality, let's just take that out of the equation. Let's say that the quality is not really that important. Uh, what, uh, G711 has a 4.1 score and G729 has a, a 3.92 score. So uh, basically kind of imperceivable, the difference. Yes, you could say, okay, well, maybe the devices don't support 711 or 729, so I might choose one or the other. But there's always a trade-off. Whenever you implement any type of, of compression, whenever you implement any type of, uh, of queuing, uh, you know, that's not related to codecs, but I'm talking about other mechanisms for, for processing voice, right? There's a trade-off between one or the other. G711 is a simple codec. It doesn't take as much processing time. It doesn't take as much memory. It doesn't take as many DSPs to process a G711 call because it's not being compressed uh, and it's not being manipulated. We're just basically quantizing the signal and sending it as it is. So G711 is a very simple codec. G729 is a more complex codec. So it's gonna take more 
bandwidth that's going to take more resources to process the call. Not more bandwidth, excuse me, more, more uh, memory, more CPU, etc. All right. So yeah, endpoint support is obviously an important thing. You want to make sure that you choose a codec that uh, uh, is that meets your requirement, right? Uh, that, that your devices support. Uh, bandwidth is a consideration. Obviously, we would choose a, a more complex codec with compression and whatnot if we have less bandwidth. Um, but when I teach my QoS classes, I teach you all about the QoS tools that are involved, but there's a point where a QoS tool becomes detrimental rather than, than helpful, right? For example, if you're doing RTP header compression or you're doing TCP payload compression or whatever, Yes, there are certain types of circuits where that compression helps. But if you try to do RTP header compression on an Ethernet circuit or TCP header compression on an Ethernet circuit or payload compression, you would actually be making a problem worse than better because it takes more time to do the compression and decompression than if you would have just sent the packet as it is without the compression, right? So there are specific scenarios where you would want to use specific tools and where you would not want to use specific tools. I would say call quality would be a concern as well, but quite frankly, there's really not much of a difference between uh, a G729 codec and 711 codec. I would argue that if you're talking to somebody with a G729 codec and then you're talking to another person on another phone with 711, you probably wouldn't even be able to tell the difference, right? Probably very, very difficult to tell the difference. Uh, but again, you're trying to balance out uh, what you gain from what you lose. And that's something to always consider. Uh, there are uh, mathematical equations that you can use to decide when to use a tool and when not to use a tool. Uh, when it comes to call bandwidths and call calculations, there is a process called an Erlang analysis, E-R-L-A-N-G. There's Erlang B and there's Erlang C. One has to do with calculating call volumes maybe to a call center. The other has to do with calculating calls over a WAN circuit and whatnot. Uh, but those ana that analysis that you perform will then result in, in you, know, you deciding what type of tool you want to use and so on. Bandwidth is typically the first thing that we consider, obviously, when we're trying to select a codec. Uh, I mean, think about it. Um, if you have a gig connection, it's probably irrelevant. But what if you have a 512K frame relay circuit? Or maybe even just a 1.544 megabits per second uh, T1 uh, for your WAN. Then, then all of a sudden, 100 G711 calls looks a lot different than 100 G729 calls. I mean, without overhead, you're talking about um, you know, 640 kilobits per second. We ran to that. Um, quite a bit at first, Scott, because we had several T1s out there, so yep, it became an issue. Right, but exactly, and you're if you're saying, I was doing my math in my head thinking that I'd do the math right, but uh, 100 times 64, right, 6400, so what is that, uh, 6400 kilobits per second, is that 6.4 megabits, something like that, uh, versus 80, 800 kilobits per second. It's a big difference when you're talking about the, the type of codec. Uh, but again, that's typically when you're dealing with slower speed links. Call quality, of course. We talked about the, uh, the, the primary way of measuring call quality um, in, in the voice world. The mean opinion score uh, is certainly one way that we can do that. There is a, another uh, call quality uh, measurement. It's called perceptible. Uh, quality uh, significance map or PQSM um, is another way for us to uh, identify call quality, but um, uh, it's not something that we typically use um, uh, in, uh, in um, most networks today. We just use mean opinion score. Both the ultimate goal of both of those are speech measurement or something. I forget what the, the actual acronym is, but uh, uh, MOS is mean opinion score, and that's again, we talked about that. That's on a, a zero to five scale or one to five scale, and five being uh, imperceptible and being perfect, right? 
uh, and 4.3 being the highest uh, possible call quality of any digitized signal, right? So 4.3 would be the, the, uh, the top level that you could get based on that Nyquist theorem that we talked about before, right? Nyquist theorem. Yeah. yeah. I don't know who Nyquist Shannon is. Uh, network latency and reliability. Of course, the larger the datagrams, the more uh, um, they're going to take to process. But if you think about it, when you're using a, a, a high complexity codec that's doing eight kilobits a second, what's the biggest issue with, uh, with that transport? Most of the data that's being generated is overhead. Right, you got your, your frame header, which is probably anywhere from, you know, I don't know, 12 bytes to 18 bytes, including the frame check sequence. You've got your uh, packet header, which is 20 bytes minimum. You've got your UDP header, which is eight bytes. You got your RTP header, which is 12 bytes. And then you got your payload, which is nothing. You know, I think it's, uh, uh, you know, much smaller, uh, 20 bytes maybe. Uh, if you're doing 20 millisecond samples at 8,000 samples per second. So you got 20 bytes of payload uh, with, you know, 40 or 50 or 60 bytes of overhead. Doesn't, it's not, not really that great, right? All right. Uh, there are other things to consider as well. Um, how does the codec deal with loss? Uh, a lot of devices, phones, for example, and, and gateways and whatnot, they can extrapolate loss. The, the, the loss that we have in voice uh, should be less than 1% packet loss. Anything over 1% packet loss, and that's going to start to generate uh, issues with the audio stream or the video stream. But one per, less than 1% packet loss, the devices can actually extrapolate what's lost uh, because we're using UDP, right? We're not getting any retransmissions. We're not delaying datagrams. So we can't recreate or retransmit the lost datagrams. We're going to have to kind of interpret or interpolate, if you will, what those lost datagrams are, right? Uh, and as long as the packet loss stays below a certain percentage, we can do that, all right? We also have codec, codec complexity, how much processing power is consumed by the codec, how many, D, how many DSP resources does that codec require, uh, given the fact that those DSPs are very, very expensive, right? Um, we, we try to avoid using them. Transcoder avoidance. Uh, ultimately, all a transcoder is, is a bunch of DSPs, right? Transcoding can only be done in hardware. You can't do transcoding in software because you're dealing with physical layer. You're dealing with signaling, right? Modulated, modulated signals. So you can't you can't do transcoding in software. Um, so basically, if you have, uh, you, you can't find a common codec, uh, then guess what happens? You have to transcode. Well, a transcoder is just a bunch of DSPs that, are, that support all the codecs that you need. Um, and again, that's a, that's a thing that takes time. Uh, the data has to be sent to the transcoder. The transcoding process has to be completed and then the data has to be sent on to the destination. So, Quick question on the DSP. Yeah, sure. So in a system, then, the DSP is called, is it called a DSP? It's called a packet voice data module, or PVDM. Uh, the PVDM is the, the actual card uh, that has the DSP processors on it. So if I wanted to add DSP, you would have to add PVDMs. Yeah, and there's PVDM 32s and 64s and 16s, uh, and they're expensive. They're very expensive. Unless you buy those Chinese knockoffs, then they're not as expensive, but. Uh, yeah, they come with a virus and a backdoor and everything. Yeah, okay. Now, that's just a module that goes into the router? Yep, it's a DIM module that goes onto the motherboard. So it has nothing to, so it, there needs to be a specific slot for it. It's yes, there is a PVDM slot on the motherboard for the PVDMs. Either on the motherboard itself or on the network module, if you have a DSP farm module or something you're putting so into a network module slot. Do they have like 
So here's an example. This is a, a voice module that has some PRI ports or digital uh, T1 type ports. These are the PBDM modules. Uh, and that, that's kind of older school there, but they, you know, they have different kinds. Um, they have, uh, that's a used module, obviously, but, and that doesn't include the PVDMs, that's just the module, but if you do, uh, so a PVDM 4-64, for example, um, and you look at what those look like, uh, so here's an example of a brand new one, it's $2,800. Right. That's yeah. So, and, and the thing is that this module, the PVDM 4-64, has a specific number of DSPs on it, uh, and those DSPs are rated to run different codecs. So, some PVDMs can only do medium complexity. Some PVDMs can do high complexity. Uh, it depends on the module. But if you look at uh, like a PBDM slot on an ISR, here's an example right here, an example where the PBDMs go on the motherboard, right? Um, so yeah, these are just modules that you, you put into the router, uh, whether it's in a network module or whether it's on the motherboard of the, or it can even be like a little riser card like this, um, where you have this little, uh, adapter to, to attach the riser card or, or attach the DIMM. Uh, there's many different form factors, but you know they're basically chips that, that uh, get inserted into the router some, some way. Make sense? So the codex here, you see a list of the codex here in the table. Uh, obviously, we could go through every one of these codex. Uh, G711 is most common, of course, an ITUT standard. That uses pulse code modulation to an, uh, encode our analog signals. Um, the, the samples that are created here is a 64K uh, data rate, uh, free license, uh, sampling uh, 8,000 hertz or 8 kilohertz. Uh, that's the number of samples per second. Uh, and a mean opinion score of 4.3, released in 1972. So, uh, a MOS of 4.3 is pretty good. That's about as high as you can get, right? In fact, it is basically as high as you get based on the sample size. Uh, G722, also an ITU T standard. It's considered a wideband speech codec. Notice the sample rate is 16,000 samples per second, <coughs> which is why it's uh, considered a wideband codec, and it generates uh, 48 um, uh, kilobits a second or... 56 kilobits a second or 64 kilobits a second. Uh, again, also something that's used in LAN deployments. Um, and uh, unlike G711, obviously you can see here where it samples at 8,000 times per second based on Nyquist theorem. Uh, G722 is double the spectrum size uh, at 16 kilohertz, right? So it offers, uh, uh, well, I, well just let me ask you, what, it, what, would be the, what would be the benefit of that? G722. You know, if we're still dealing with the same data rates, 64K, uh, 48K, or 52K, or 56K, what would be the benefit of doing twice the amount of samples? More accurate, right. It's gonna generate more data, uh, more packets per second, in the form of packets per second, but it's also gonna have a significant improvement on the quality of the audio uh, uh, based on the narrowband codec. So, by the way, that's a term that you understand now. Narrowband means 8K or 8,000 samples per second. Wideband is more than 8,000 samples per second. All right? Uh, ILBC, that's another speech codec uh, designed for narrowband speech as well. Uh, you notice that ILBC uses uh, both 8, uh, 8K and uh, 16K. Uh, mean opinion score 4.14, so it's still over tow quality. Uh, if there are lost frames, um, ILBC does uh, handle the voice quality issues uh, with um, uh, degradation. Um, you know, it, it is basically a, a, a it's, I wouldn't say it's a standard codec, but it is certainly a high quality codec. Uh, but it is 
uh, it does generate a much lower bandwidth, right? Only 13.3 kilobits per second uh, in, the, um, in the amount of bandwidth that's utilized, right? Opus we don't care about. G729, uh, that's a compressed codec, so it comes in a, a, a medium complexity and high complexity. Uh, Cisco implements G729 with 8K uh, as a high complexity codec, so it requires a lot of processing power. Uh, their compression algorithm uh, is really what takes up all the processing uh, with the codec. Uh, G729A is also an 8K codec. Uh, but it's not as processor intensive. So G729A is considered a medium complexity codec, uh, and it's just a variant of G729. Slightly lower voice quality uh, and uh, more susceptible to loss uh, and so on. All right. Uh, tandeming is something that they mention in the book, specifically distortion of the speech during the coding and decoding process and so on. There is an Annex B version of G729 as well. The Annex B version just adds that voice activity detection that we talked about previously and the comfort noise generation. Uh, and we talked about that. The, the VAD actually saves quite a bit of bandwidth. Uh, the estimate is about 35% of the bandwidth is saved by using voice activity detection. Um, and uh, we, we talked also about what comfort noise generation is. Uh, provides us the ability to uh, generate noise at the local side, not over the not over the the WAN or over the data circuit, but at the local side, so that people f still hear that white noise, uh, you know, that they would expect to hear based on what's happening in a traditional uh, traditional circuit, like a traditional TDM circuit. All right. Now, something that you may not be as familiar, video codecs, uh, very similar. Right, obviously in this case we're trying to encode not only audio but video as well. Uh, they, they work, uh, all the video codecs basically work this, the same. They take an individual frame of the video or a group of pixels if you will, uh, a block of pixels in the video itself, uh, uh, they, and then those get grouped into macro blocks and then the codec will start to encode that information. Uh, so macro blocks are basically, uh, uh, you know, that are in a contiguous row, if you will. That's what we call a single row of macro blocks, and then those get encoded. Uh, to reduce the amount of data in video, video codecs identify changes from one frame to the next. So if you ever watch video, especially if you watch like streaming sports and stuff like that online, the stuff that's not changing always looks like it's in high def, right? So maybe it's the audience or maybe it's something around uh, as long as the camera's not moving. But then the people moving around always look like they're pixelated and whatnot because they're not, re they're not encoding the information that's not changing. They're only encoding the stuff that's moving. So that saves a lot of bandwidth in that case. So we're not, we're not encoding the, the, uh, the full amount of information. Uh, initially, we'll have to encode the full frame, of course, because we have to have something uh, to, to display that's called the iframe, uh, and that becomes my starting point, if you will, of the encoding process. And then the second frame is compared against the first frame, and then we identify those macro blocks where changes occurred, and those are called the, the P, P frames, right? The, the predictive uh, coded frames, or the, the B frames, the bidirectional predictive coded frames that's what's actually being encoded and decoded. So they, they talk about that a little bit here in the book um, with the I-frame and the P-frame and so on. So these frames here didn't change. Those become my, this is my I-frame. This little guy here hiking up the hill, he's, so these are the, the macro blocks that are changing uh, and that's what's gonna get encoded. So that's why you always kind of see the difference there. All right. Um, Video tends to be more loss sensitive than voice. Why? More data, more data right? Uh, video compression works differently. Uh, uh, voice codecs are much different than video codecs. Uh, and so, uh, plus there's also, it, video tends to be more bursty depending on how much of the video is changing, how much of the iframes are changing, uh, which would result in the P-frames, of course. But, um, you know, 
it depends on how many P frames or B frames you have, will depend on how much information is being encoded. Some of the common codecs that you're going to see, uh, MPEG-2, MPEG-4, uh, H.264, H.265, uh, they use different compression algorithms, uh, and we don't need to get into the specifics of that, but uh, that, allow, they, that allow us to, to compress the, the video. All right? So if you're, uh, if you're doing like some sort of temporal compression algorithm or uh, a spatial compression algorithm, uh, which is usually what's used on the, the, the whole image, if you will, or the whole picture, if you will, to reduce the number of bytes that are being encoded, uh, then that's where you start to see that pixelization or that loss in the encoding process. Of course, you also have to encode the audio as well. Right? You have to encode the audio as well. Uh, and so um, that, that's part of the encoding process too. Uh, what do we have to consider when it comes to codec selection? The same thing that we would have to consider with a voice codec. What is the quality? The bit rate, which is kind of equivalent to bandwidth. We, we had a bandwidth box here before, but that's similar to, to bandwidth. Do I need transcoding resources? What's the complexity of the codec? And so on. All right, and then we have a, a comparison, if you will, of the different codec types. That's kind of the last thing we'll see here. H.264, MPEG-4, it's an advanced video coding codec uh, released in 2003. One of the most widely used codecs, I would say. Netflix, Google, YouTube all use this. Uh, and uh, um, its predecessor, H.263, which is MPEG-2, uh, same concept as far as the encoding techniques and the encoding methods, it's just less uh, bit rate, right? Um, so MPEG-4 cut the bit rate in half, but still kind of maintained the same quality that we saw with uh, H.263 uh, in H.264, all right? Uh, it uh, supports uh, both spatial and temporal compression, supports resolutions up to 8K, ultra high def, uh, 8192 by 4320, uh, and so on. All right, H.265 evolved from H.264. That came out in 2013. Uh, the bit rate was halved again, but still maintaining the same kind of quality, uh, and so on. So I'm not particularly versed in all the video codecs myself. Uh, I'm not a video person per se. I mean, I understand video endpoints from the perspective of telepresence and video, but um, it is another interesting uh, concept. Um, it's obviously completely different than what you would see in the audio world. All right. So in this section here, we're going to talk about the math, uh, uh, how we would calculate maybe a bandwidth per call based on the codec selection and so on. So uh, what kind of bandwidth is going to be used by a codec? Pretty important, right? So you've got, uh, you, what you're seeing here on the diagram here is your, is your, your PDU. Right, your packet that you're, that's carrying your voice payload. And I I'd mentioned this a couple of times previously. You've got your layer two header, which would depend on the type of layer two encapsulation, but if it's ethernet, it's gonna be 14 bytes, right? 18, 18 bytes if you talk about the frame check sequence. So you got 18 bytes of overhead there. You got your 20 byte header. You've got an eight byte UDP header. You've got your 12 byte RTP header. Uh, and then you got your voice payload, and the voice payload side, size is going to change based on what type of uh, codec you're using, right? Without compressed RTP, uh, RTP header compression is what it's called, 40 bytes of overhead. With RTP header compression, 2 to 4 bytes. So you might look at that and go, well, wait a minute. If I can turn on RTP header compression, and I can take that 40 bytes of information and shrink it down to two to four bytes, why wouldn't I do that all the time? Because that takes processing power, because that takes time. And if I'm not seeing any loss or I'm not seeing any issue without doing the compression, why would I add the overhead of processing to enforce the compression when it's not necessary, right? So to understand how uh, how all of this takes effect on your, your voice and video. It's important for you to obviously understand how the packets are constructed. Uh, and it is a UDP based, this is the media stream, this is not the control, this is not the SIP control or the skinny control, that's all TCP based traffic. 
this is the actual RTP media stream. And you can see kind of the, the, the construction there, all right? Of course, the voice payload is gonna contain the data that's being constructed based on the quantization process and the companding process that takes our data and converts it into packets. Uh, the amount of data that's in the payload is gonna be based on two values. What are those two values? The codec that you choose and the sample size, right? Cisco uses a 20 millisecond sample size, but it can be modified to 30 milliseconds, for example. So you can packetize 30 milliseconds of data, or you can packetize 20 milliseconds of data. Uh, if you do 20 milliseconds of data, you're gonna be able to generate more packets per second, but it's gonna incorporate more overhead. If you do 30 millisecond samples, you're gonna have more payload, but you're gonna have less overhead, right? So there's a trade-off there as well. And there's a, a, a decision tree that you walk through to decide whether or not you're gonna to decide to use a 20 millisecond sample size or a 30 millisecond sample size. Right, when you talk about transmitting voice, what are the three characteristics from a propagation perspective, the three characteristics that we're concerned about? Delay, packet getting from point A to point B. Loss, the amount of packets that are lost in a UDP stream, and jitter, right? Delay and loss, pretty easy to understand. If it takes less than 150 milliseconds, we're good. Uh, packet loss, less than 1% packet loss, we're good. The third one is what? Jitter, jitter right? What is jitter? Variation. Variation of delay between the datagrams, right? Because we're processing other datagrams in between, and that jitter rate needs to be in less than 40 milliseconds. Usually we try to do anywhere from 20 to 40 milliseconds. Why is it 40 milliseconds? Because there's a playout buffer in the phone. Every Cisco phone has a playout buffer. It buffers the stream of data that's coming in so that it can normalize the stream before it sends it to, or converts it and sends it up to the headset. That playout buffer is only about 40 milliseconds large. So anything over 40 milliseconds, we can't delay that traffic anymore and we have to play it out. That's gonna result in gaps in the audio stream, which is basically directly results in noise, essentially, all right? Our layer three headers, uh, uh, RTP, of course, UDP. Uh, I don't know why the book calls them layer three headers. They're not, RTP is really, uh, well, it is, uh, it's application layer, really. Uh, UDP is transport layer, IP is the, the uh, layer three header, but layer three and above, I guess. So we're talking about 40 bytes of overhead per packet. Again, it is possible to reduce that size if you use compression, but there's a trade-off for compression. So typically we would see like um, uh, compression done on slower speed links. Uh, typically links that are slower than 768K, for example. Uh, because one of the big issues with uh, packet delivery over a serial link is serialization delay. How long does it take to process that packet onto the wire? And that can introduce jitter in our transmissions. All right, so that's something to, uh, to consider. So here's an example of uh, different audio codecs, G711. Uh, generally, our packetization period is gonna be about 20 milliseconds. But again, we can go up to 30 milliseconds or even 40 milliseconds with G729. 50 packets per second versus 33 packets per second. But again, that 33 packets per second includes less overhead. It's more payload, but less overhead. So about 160 bytes of, of voice payload minus the overhead. Uh, for G711 at 20 milliseconds, about 240 bytes of payload. Uh, but the bandwidth per call, notice it went down as our packetization period went up. That's counterintuitive, isn't it? You would say, well, if I'm carrying more payload, why would my bandwidth go down? Because you have less overhead. If you think about it, the overhead counts for a significant percentage of the actual packet itself. Uh, in the case of G729, the overhead is more than the payload. Uh, you've got 40 bytes of overhead, uh, just layer three, layer four, and, and the application layer, not including layer two, than you have in the payload, right? So uh, it is counterintuitive uh, bandwidth per call uh, with the 
with the overhead, right, 74.6 kilobits per second for G711 at a 30 millisecond sample rate. Uh, now, why would you decide to sample at a, at a shorter, in a shorter time frame as opposed to sampling in a longer time frame? The shorter samples handle loss better because you're losing less data, right? One and a half times the amount of data carried in a 30 millisecond sample as opposed to a 20 millisecond sample. Well, it's one and a half times the, the size at least. Well, not one and a half, but you get the idea. 10 milliseconds more. So if I lose a 30 millisecond sample, for example, I'm losing more audio and that might be easily more perceptible. All right. So uh, there are actually even other options. You can actually sample at 10 milliseconds in Call Manager at G711, not at G729, but G711, you can sample at 10 milliseconds. Now you're generating 100 packets per second, uh, but the voice payload is, is only 80 bytes in that case, which makes sense because uh, 20 milliseconds is 160 bytes. All right. The bandwidth basically, consumption basically remains the same. All right. Uh, in fact, the bandwidth consumption is always the same for the payload, but it's not the same for the overhead because of the number of packets per second that we're processing. At 10 milliseconds, we're processing 100 packets per second. At 20 milliseconds, we're processing 50 packets per second. And at 30 milliseconds, we're processing 33.3 packets per second. So multiply that times the amount of overhead, and that, that gives you an idea of, of the variation there. All right. So sending more packets per second has an advantage, right? Uh, better packet concealment, or concealment during loss is what I'm saying. And that's what I was trying to describe earlier. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm sending more packets per second, I'm encapsulating less actual raw data per packet. So if I lose a packet, it's easier for me to interpret or interpolate what I lost and replace that as opposed to the larger packets. All right. Now, what about security? What if I add security to this as well? I guess it depends on what kind of security you run. Right? If you're running ESP, which is encapsulated security payload, uh, and you have authentication and encryption, then you're adding a significant amount of overhead. All right. We see there, for example, G729 by itself, with the overhead, generates 24 kilobits a second. Now, if I do secure RTP on top of that, now we're adding four bytes of overhead. Then I add GRE the GRE header plus the, uh, which is four bytes, and then the GRE IP packet header, which is 20 bytes. Now I've got an additional 24 bytes of overhead. Uh, and then if I add ESP on top of that, you can see now we're pretty much doubling the amount of bandwidth that's necessary for the call. So always keep in mind, and we're not even considering at this point the delay, right? The delay to do encryption and decryption, we're, we're basically just considering the, the raw overhead. But that's an important concept to understand. You need to be aware of what each of these, these applications add to the overall, um, the overall overhead because you might be calculating, making your, way, your, your Erlang calculations or your bandwidth consumption calculations based on uh, you know, just the basic numbers, right? G729 by itself, not taking into account all the overhead. In reality, if I was to do the last box there, I would need twice as much bandwidth for the same number of calls. You know, 10 calls with the top ones at 240 kilobits per second, 10 calls with the bottom one is 540 kilobits per second. Double, basically. All right. So they do go through an example, a, a calculation, if you will. The calculations aren't very complex as long as you know what all the numbers are, right? As, as long as you know what each of the headers represent and so on. So let's say we're doing G729 at 50 packets per second. Remember that is a, a sample size of 20 milliseconds, which is the standard for, for Cisco. So we're sampling at 20 milliseconds, 50 packets per second over MPLS. All right, so our layer two bandwidth is 25.6 kilobits per second. That's 50 packets per second times 20 bytes for the voice payload. 
because we're sampling at 20 milliseconds a sample, 8,000 times per second, 8 bytes per sample. You do that math, it comes up with 20, 20 bytes, bytes for the voice payload, 40 bytes for the RTP, UDP, and IP headers, plus 4 bytes for the Layer 2 MPLS. So we're talking about a, a VPLS type scenario or a, or a VPWS type scenario, not a Layer 3 MPLS VPN. All right. And then we multiply or divide that all by a thousand, um, you know, to convert it to its uh, um, appropriate value, right? Because we're talking about uh, packets per second, bytes per second. We need that in, in kilobits per second. If I add SRTP on top of that, we're adding an additional uh, four bytes for the SRTP header. Uh, and then if I add ESP on top of that, we're adding an additional um, 76 bytes for the security overhead. Not just the, the header, but the entire ESP header and footer and so on. All right. So just by adding, again, like we saw with the previous example, just by adding additional features to the stream, we're practically doubling the amount of bandwidth that's necessary for that particular call. All right. For video, obviously with video, we're dealing with much higher bandwidths, right? We're dealing with much larger bandwidths. So to decide which bandwidth we are, which bandwidth we need to support, we need to understand the number of frames per second. FPS is frames per second. Typically 30 frames per second, but a lot of video captures at 60 frames per second now. Um, and then we have to identify, you know, are, are, is it a, uh, uh, a um, high resolution, medium resolution, or low resolution, or normal re resolution image. Uh, and so that the resolution is across the top there, w W288 or W448 or W576 or 720 or 1080 or even higher than that, right? For 4K or, or ultra high def. All right, they don't really get into the math of it in this particular case, um, but again, this is something that you would have to take into account. We do have to consider video because pretty much every modern Cisco endpoint supports video. Uh, you know, they have cameras built into them or they can, you can use a camera attached to your PC. Uh, so video is almost uh, kind of second nature in the system now. So it is something that you have to consider. Okay. Uh, you might see a couple of calculations on the test. Uh, you know, from a very high level perspective, you, you, so you might have to know some of these numbers. All right, so we're going to get into discovery number nine, explore the Cisco VoIP bandwidth calculator, uh, which uh, is really just the tool that's online. And then we'll get into call emission control and we'll wrap up this section. All right, in Discovery 9, we're going to take a look at Cisco Voice over IP, uh, and specifically the Cisco Voice over IP bandwidth calculator. Uh, we're going to access the uh, Cisco Voice Codec bandwidth calculator. You can see the URL there, uh, cway.cisco.com slash vc-calculator. Uh, and we're going to uh, kind of play around with a, a couple of different bandwidth requirements for different scenarios. Uh, and uh, we're not really going to be doing anything with equipment necessarily in this particular case. Uh, we will uh, be taking a look at uh, configuring regions and locations in discovery number 10. Uh, but for now, let's go ahead and, and take a look at doing some various calculations. Uh, we're going to use this codec uh, bandwidth calculator. Uh, and let's take a look first at calculating bandwidth for G711 calls. All right. So we're going to go to our codec and we're going to select all G711 variants. Uh, we're going to say that the voice protocol is going to be voice over IP, uh, voice over ATM and voice over frame relay, not something that we're going to see too often these days. Uh, we're going to specify 10 calls and the voice payload size is going to be 80 bytes. All right. Uh, now, uh, typically that depends on the sample size that you're implementing, whether it's a 10 millisecond, 20 millisecond, 30 millisecond sample size, we're basing this on a smaller sample size. All right, uh, uh, we might actually change that. We'll see if we're gonna go with a, a standard uh, sample size, but I think we're, we're gonna be okay with a payload size of 80 bytes right now. 
We're also going to go ahead and say in the media access that we're going to go ahead and do PPP. Um, and specifically, we're going to select uh, uh, PPP from the drop down here. You can see that we have Ethernet, we have Frame Relay, HDLC. The reason for selecting the media access is we need to know what kind of overhead exists in the, uh, in the process. Uh, are we going to enable RTP header compression? Uh, we'll go ahead and leave that off for now. We're going to assume that this is a higher speed circuit. Uh, and um, and uh, based on that, we'll, we'll leave off the compression. So the codec bit rate is 64 kilobits a second. That's the sample size times 8 divided by the codec sample interval. Uh, the codec sample size is 80 bytes. So that's the size of each sample. Uh, the bit interval is 10 milliseconds. Uh, that's uh, so we're encapsulating uh, essentially 10 milliseconds of data. Uh, you know, we talked about the quantization process uh, and we talked about, you know, the quantization scale. And that's why we have kind of a, a smaller, uh, a smaller uh, value here in this particular case. All right. The voice packets per second is going to be 100 voice packets per second. Uh, we're going to require a bandwidth per call of 101.60 kilobits per second. That means we have about 5 kilobits or 5.08 kilobits of overhead uh, per call. Uh, so if we take that bandwidth per call and we add that overhead, we get about 106.68 kilobits per second of total bandwidth that's necessary. All right. Uh, so that's per call. All right. And uh, the bandwidth uh, for all calls, uh, multiply that times 10, of course, is 1,016 kilobits per second, uh, including the overhead is 1,066.80 kilobits per second. So this is taking into account the RTP overhead, the UDP overhead, the, the framing overhead, uh, and uh, also the payload size as well. All right, now if I decide to do compression, uh, you can see that I can reduce the amount of uh, bandwidth required. Uh, but keep in mind as we're doing compression, if I'm doing RTP only compression, uh, and if that compression is on, it's about 71.2 kilobits per second per call. If the compression is off, it's 101.6. Uh, so keep in mind as you're, you're trying to evaluate whether compression should be something that you enable or not, uh, there's a trade-off between doing the compression and uh, what you actually save in bandwidth. Uh, there's a time and a complexity requirement for doing that compression, uh, so we have to measure whether or not uh, we're actually going to save. So overall, with the overhead, we're only saving about 30 kilobits a second per call. Uh, that could be pretty significant, uh, you know, if... Uh, if, if we have a, a, a very limited amount of bandwidth on the circuit. We can also see some of the other payload sizes. Uh, let's go ahead and actually change the payload size to 240 kilobits in this, in this case. All right, 240 kilobits. We'll use everything else is going to remain the same. Uh, and you'll notice here, let's just go to the uh, actual um, uh, bandwidth utilization for all of the calls. So we're talking about 765.33 kilobits per second or 803 kilobits per second. You might look at that and go, wait a minute. That went down because before we had 1,016 kilobits per second and we had 1,066.80 kilobits per second. But keep in mind, as we're packetizing more data, we're sending fewer frames, right? We're only sending 34 packets per second Previously, we were sending quite a bit more, right? We were uh, actually sending quite a bit more. Um, and uh, as such, it required more overhead. Each packet had to be an encapsulated separately. Uh, and as such, it would generate uh, more bandwidth because we had more overhead. So this is another thing to consider when you're trying to select an appropriate codec. You want to make sure that you're selecting something that uh, kind of balances uh, the speed for the actual overhead and bandwidth that you're actually utilizing for that particular packet. Now, a sample size of 200 and, uh, uh, 240 bytes uh, might be too large. We might introduce too much jitter. Uh, 
or too much delay between the different packets. Uh, so that's something to consider as well. All right. Uh, now let's go ahead and say we're going to run this over a secure tunnel. So we're going to go ahead and add our secure tunneling in this, uh, in this scenario. Uh, we'll do a uh, basic uh, uh, kind of miscellaneous secure tunneling. We're just going to say, let's just do a, a typical 64 byte overhead for secure tunneling. All right. Now, if I go down to the bandwidth requirements, I'm adding 64 bytes of overhead. But again, I'm only generating, I'm still generating fewer packets or kilobits per second requirements for the calls themselves. You know, we're still uh, about, um, you know, uh, we had 1,066.8 before, so about 40 or, or so kilobits per second less in this particular case. All right. So it's a great tool to be able to kind of identify uh, what overhead, uh, how, we're, how we're doing the calculation. So we're doing 240 bytes of raw data. Uh, we have 64 bytes of tunneling overhead. Our IP overhead is 20 bytes. Our UDP header is 8 bytes. Our RTP header is 12 bytes. Uh, and, that, uh, and then our frame flag is 1 byte. So this is how they're coming up with those individual calculations. All right. Now we can see if I went back to an 80 byte sample rate, uh, the bandwidth per call is 160 kilobits per second. Uh, and if I multiply that 10 times 10, that's 1600 kilobits per second. So it's pretty significant difference. All right, let's go down and take a look at our G729 now. We're going to do 10 calls. Uh, our payload size in this case is going to be much smaller because we're actually uh, uh, running, um, you know, a, a much smaller codec, right? Uh, much less dense codec, a little bit more complex, but much less dense codec. Uh, and in this case, we can see our bandwidth consumption goes down pretty significantly, right? We have about uh, 50 packets per second, uh, 52.4 kilobits per second uh, per call. Uh, that seems a little high. Let me see what I'm missing here. It seems like it should be uh, about 26.8. Um, let me reset everything and then kind of go back and do the calculation again. All variants, the voice protocol is voice over IP, the payload size is 20 bytes, and we're gonna do PPP for our layer two. Yeah, there we go. I don't know, we have, must have had something in there uh, that didn't kind of clear out. Uh, because this is pretty typical, right? 26.8 kilobits per second per call uh, at 50 packets per second, about 1.34 kilobits per second overhead, which gives us 28.14 kilobits per call. I'll multiply that times 10, 281.4 kilobits per call. And the nice thing about this is that we're still getting a relatively uh, high mean opinion score. I mean, the call itself is still relatively, uh, you know, close to toll quality, like a 3.8 or 3.9. Uh, so you might say, well, why wouldn't I just do this all the time? Right? Well, there's a cost of using a complex or a medium complexity, high complexity or a medium complexity codec. It's going to take DSPs, it's going to take resources, uh, and if it's not necessary because we have enough bandwidth in our, WAN, or in our LAN, there's really no reason to actually do it. All right. Now, let's go ahead and enable RTP header compression and see how that changes the call. Uh, went down pretty significantly, right? from 28.6 to 11.6 kilobits per second, uh, overall 12.8 kilobits per second, and the 10 calls will only cost us 128.8 kilobits per second. All right, again, you might say, well, why don't I just do that then? Why don't I just uh, utilize that header compression? Well, it takes time to compress and it takes time to decompress. So that's a consideration that you have to take into account as well. All right, there's always kind of this balance or trade-off that you're going to have uh, between utilizing one uh, technique for, for, uh, for, for encoding the voice and decoding the voice uh, and other kind of bandwidth efficiency techniques. Uh, in a LAN, it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense because the amount of resources, the amount of processing, uh, the amount of time it takes to do all these things uh, doesn't really help. I mean, if you think about it, you've got a gigabit Ethernet connection.
uh, or even a, a fast ethernet connection, you're only talking about using 1200K of that for, uh, uh, for voice. Uh, it's not that significant, all right? Uh, kilobits, not, not gigabits. So it's, uh, it, it doesn't make sense in those scenarios to kind of utilize those, um, uh, those tools in this, uh, in this transaction, all right? So let's go ahead and change our payload size, in this case, to 40, uh, 40 uh, kilobits or, uh, or bytes in the payload. Uh, and we can see that our bandwidth went up to 9.8 kilobits per second, uh, a total of 10.29 kilobits per second. Uh, again, we can carry more data, the, the, or went down, excuse me, I should say, uh, was 11.6 and it went down to 9.8. Because again, we're not, we don't have as much of that overhead. All right, so uh, this is one of the tools that can be really, really useful for kind of planning uh, your bandwidth requirements for site-to-site -site calling, for WAN calling, or even how much bandwidth is going to be utilized within your enterprise, right, for voice traffic and so on. Uh, relatively uh, simple, I mean, voice traffic is relatively benign in most cases. The biggest concern about voice is does it get there fast enough uh, and uh, is the, are the inter-packet delays consistent and small, right? That's the jitter that we talked about when we were talking about our codec uh, process a little bit earlier, all right? So just something to keep in mind, a uh, great little tool. Uh, there's a bunch of tools actually uh, that Cisco provides for the voice space, so I highly recommend that you go out to cisco.com and take a look at all of the voice-related tools uh, there's POE or power consumption tools, there's uh, additional codec uh, calculators, bandwidth calculators, uh, and so on. All right, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up this discovery. Uh, we're going to get into describing call admission control, and then we're going to jump into discovery number 10, configuring regions and locations. All right, so our final topic in this particular section here is all about uh, call admission control. And we will be spending some time uh, talking about uh, call admission control, of course, in this section. And then in the next section, we'll be talking about uh, dial plan, endpoint addressing, and so on. And we're going to get into some other additional topics about uh, calling privileges and toll fraud prevention. But call admission control is not uh, necessarily a component that is designed to provide those types of features. Uh, because we are routing calls over our network, over the LAN, over the WAN, uh, potentially between multiple locations or multiple sites, it's important for us to understand the impact that those calls are going to have on our bandwidth. Uh, because if I oversubscribe the amount of bandwidth that I have on a particular circuit, Let's say that I've calculated that I can support 12 G729 calls over a WAN link, and a 13th call gets processed. Which calls would be affected due to the lack of bandwidth? All of them, right. Not just the 13th call, all of the calls will be affected. So that's an important to, uh, a concept to understand. Every single call can be affected if we oversubscribe our link. Uh, we don't just affect the last call. So we want to make sure that the quality of all of our calls uh, remain intact. Uh, and what call admission control allows us to do is it allows us to monitor uh, or, or put in place controls that allow us to ensure that our call quality remains the same. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that we are going to drop that 13th call. Uh, that's certainly something that could happen. For example, you might get a message on the screen when you try to progress that 13th call that says not enough bandwidth. If you are uh, you know, kind of taking a hard tack on, on managing the bandwidth in your enterprise. Uh, or you could simply do alternate routing, what we call AAR. Um, and that allows us to perhaps, rather than route that call over the WAN, route that call over the PSTN, doing some number translation, some number expansion, uh, transformations on the dial plan, and so on. 
So the, the end user doesn't know necessarily that the call was rerouted uh, because the call still proceeded, but we're not uh, exceeding the bandwidth on our, on our, on our link. Uh, there are generally two ways to provide call emission control with the Unified Communications Manager system. Uh, we can do uh, uh, CUCM based call emission control with locations and regions, or we can do gatekeeper controlled call emission control where we have an actual uh, uh, router acting as a, a traffic cop, if you will, monitoring the, uh, the call progress, monitoring the number of calls between each site, what codecs are being used for those calls, and so on, and then either allowing or disallowing the call based on, uh, based on what, you know, what policies are in place uh, and uh, how much bandwidth we have, and so on. So we're not going to get necessarily into the gatekeeper controlled uh, uh, calling, uh, call emission control specifically. The, the general idea here is that we're going to set up uh, CUCM based call emission control. And by the way, in centralized calling, uh, that's generally the call emission control uh, a component that we'll put into place. If I have distributed calling with multiple, multiple, uh, multiple locations where the calls can originate, uh, and they're being managed by multiple clusters or they're being managed by multiple subscribers throughout the enterprise, then I might choose to use some sort of gatekeeper controlled call emission control. But overall, the concept is that we want to limit the number of calls uh, between certain locations or between certain endpoints so that we make sure that we don't oversubscribe our bandwidth with too many calls. Quality of service can help with maintaining the quality of the calls individually, but quality of service doesn't generally take into account all of the calls that are progressing. So we can implement prioritization so that we're reducing delay, we're reducing jitter, uh, we're reducing packet loss, but ultimately uh, if you oversubscribe a circuit, there's nothing that quality of service can do uh, to, to undersubscribe that link again. If there's just too many packets, there's too many packets. All right, so each voice call is sent using TDM technology, time division multiplexing, so we're not necessarily uh, slicing out or allocating um, a specific path for a particular voice call. We're all sharing the same resources. Uh, the one WAN link between the two locations. So the diagram here kind of depicts that. You got three dot, uh, G729, G.729 calls, 24 kilobits per second each. That's with the overhead, of course. Uh, and QoS is prioritizing uh, 64 kilobits per second using low latency queuing. Uh, we, didn't, we don't really get into the QoS specifics in this class, but Low latency queuing is a combination of priority queuing for the voice traffic and then class-based weighted fair queuing for our remaining classes of traffic. But uh, it's just a different congestion management technique that we use, um, but it is a specific type of congestion management, specifically uh, priority queuing and class-based weighted fair queuing. Uh, but again, because we've only allocated or accounted for 64 kilobits a second, we've got two calls would have been fine, right? Two calls would have uh, been 48 kilobits per second. But uh, again, we add the third call and the bandwidth is slightly, in this case, oversubscribed. All the calls will be affected. And that's a very, very important concept. I would rather uh, affect one call by either rerouting it through the PSTN or just simply not, allow not allowing that call to proceed uh, rather than affect every single call. And keep in mind, we're generally not talking these days about circuits that are 64K, right? Uh, it's very rare. Uh, you know, we might have a T1 or, or, or you know, a, a, a 1.54 megabit circuit at a particular location, uh, but it's very rare uh, to see things like frame relay with, with the CIR of 512K or 768K uh, uh, that you might see back in the day, all right? So centralized call emission control uh, is, is probably the simplest type of call emission control. Uh, generally, that means that you have uh, one call manager cluster or one unified communications manager cluster uh, 
you have uh, you know remote gateways at the other locations maybe for local PSTN dialing but uh, you have kind of a hub and spoke type of topology where all the calls originate from the, the headquarter location and they're going to get sent over to the branch locations and so on. In centralized call mission control, generally call manager is the one that's controlling the cluster and monitoring the calling that's going on between different locations. Uh, and we call this location-based call admission control uh, where we use the locations and the regions. The regions allow us to specify what codecs are used per call. So for example, if I'm calling from HQ to branch one, I have a region for HQ and I have a region for branch one and I specify that the preferred codec to communicate between the HQ location and the branch one location is G729. Locations uh, allow me to specify how much bandwidth in total I'm allowing between each location. So I have a location for HQ, I have a location for branch one, uh, and I say that I'm allowing um, you know, uh, 800 kilobits a second in voice or, or uh, you know, uh, one meg in video or whatever it might be, okay? So locations and regions are a way that we uh, manage that centralized call emission control uh, at a minimum. At a minimum, we can say if, there's, if we're monitoring the number of calls and we've uh, either reached or come close to exceeding what our, our allocation is, the next call is just simply not going to proceed. And you would literally see a message on the screen. As soon as you dial the number and as soon as the route plan identifies that that call is going to be routed over the WAN, the call would fail and you would see a screen, uh, uh, a message on the screen saying not enough bandwidth. Uh, and the call would uh, just simply not proceed. So uh, that is a, that's most likely what you guys are going to be doing in the next discovery, which is discovery number 10, uh, or discovery, uh, yeah, 10, configuring regions and locations, uh, and um, you'll set up that centralized call emission control. Now you can com uh, uh, configure AAR. AAR is automatic alternate routing. Uh, as the name implies, it says, okay, well, if the call is going to be, uh, is, if the call is going to fail, we know that we have a PSTN connection, uh, and we know that we could certainly route this call as a standard PSTN call. So rather than simply denying the call and saying there's not enough bandwidth, what we will do is we will change the properties of the DNS and the ANI. Uh, by doing either number expansion or number transformation and will automatically route the call over the PSTN, right? And again, from the, from the uh, user's perspective, they're not aware that this is even occurring. Uh, the call is just proceeding as it normally would. Uh, so maybe I dial an extension in the branch with AAR enabled, that extension will then get uh, expanded, the destination or DNS dialed number uh, will get expanded to a 10 digit E.164 number uh, or even a, a globalized uh, international number and the call will proceed. Uh, assuming that the phone has the appropriate calling privileges. But guess what? There's a normal calling search base for the phone and then there's an AAR search base for the phone. So you can override what the normal behavior of the phone would be uh, without having to impose new restrictions or, or fewer restrictions on that phone to dial because you can set up an AAR search space that says, okay, for this call, because we don't have enough bandwidth, we're going to go ahead and allow this call to proceed even though the user doesn't necessarily have long distance calling privileges. Um, so you can imagine setting up AAR is, uh, is something that takes a little bit more, right? Because you have to set up how the numbers are going to be expanded. You have to set up the routing. You have to set up the AAR search spaces uh, and so on. So it's not just a, a checkbox that you just check that says reroute the call over the PSTN. There's a few different things that you have to set up when that trigger takes place, when the call fails, uh, 
to be able to, to route the call effectively. Uh, another option is to do what we call distributed call admission control. This is a little bit more um, uh, complex. Uh, traditionally, in this case, we would use something called gatekeepers and gateways to be able to manage calling privileges and so on. Uh, CUCM is, is in some cases not able to manage call admission control because you might have multiple clusters. Uh, and, and in order for me to manage call admission control centrally, I have to be aware of what all the calls are. Well, if there are some calls coming from one cluster and some calls coming from another cluster, I have no way of, of knowing, uh, you know, keeping track of what all those calls are and so on. So uh, when we have multiple clusters or we have a very complex uh, um, scenario or design where we have multiple paths, maybe it's not a hub and spoke type of environment, maybe it's a full mesh, maybe it's a partial mesh and so on, it makes it a lot more difficult to manage call emission control from a central location. So we will use location bandwidth manager service um, uh, and uh, a cube, uh, a Cisco unified border element uh, to be able to, to act as a, uh, a gatekeeper, that's the term that we used to use, uh, or a proxy to be able to identify whether the call should be able to proceed or whether the call shouldn't be able to proceed. And that cube uh, would actually be managing the calls for both clusters. Uh, it, would be, it would be essentially maintaining a, a knowledge base or a database of all of the information uh, for the calls that are proceeding from each of the clusters. Uh, with an understanding, of course, of what all the circuit paths are and, and, and the, the bandwidth allocation and so on that we have for each of those circuit paths. All right? Well, at that point, you probably want an SME, right? Yes. New yeah. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, and um, it gets a lot more complicated in that regard, right? Um, because there's a lot of moving parts in that, in that environment. But it's actually uh, pretty critical, pretty important to have that. It's very important to have that, actually. So uh, that's our brief introduction to call admission control. Uh, so we are going to jump into discovery number 10, uh, configuring regions and locations. Uh, and then we'll wrap up this exploring codex section. And in the next section, we're going to get into dial plan. All right. Talking about the call routing logic and digit analysis and patterns uh, and so on. All right, welcome to discovery number 10. Uh, discovery number 10, we're gonna be configuring regions and locations. Uh, to keep the benefit of location-based call admission control, uh, two things that we have to configure within the enterprise are regions and locations. Uh, and in this discovery, we're basically gonna walk through the steps of understanding and configuring these two components within our topology. All right, we've got our call manager, we've got our local switch, a couple of PCs running Cisco IP communicator, a DNS server, and our IMNP server. So the first thing, let's go ahead and go into PC number one. Uh, and we are going to uh, start by configuring uh, the, these locations and regions on PC number one. All right, so we're gonna log into our call manager administration page, uh, and we are gonna go to our call manager administration and we're going to go ahead and set up our region information first all right accept our self-signed certificate proceed log in all right now uh, when it comes to regions and locations everything is going to be configured within unified communications manager and then we're going to identify uh, how we can utilize these based on the device pool uh, that is set up with the actual phone. So let's go into our region information first. Uh, and what we're going to do with these regions is we're going to set up uh, the, uh, the regions for our dialing. Now if you look at the default, or at least what's uh, installed in the system by default, we only have a default region. Let's go ahead and add a new region. In this case, we're going to call this region HQ for headquarters. We'll save that information. And you can see what we have here 
is we have essentially the types of, uh, of codecs that we are going to allow uh, for the, uh, the calling between different regions. So we can specify the maximum audio bit rate per call. We can also specify the maximum session bit rate for video calls or the maximum session bit rate for immersive video calls. Uh, right now, we're going to go ahead and add another region. This region is going to be called branch one. Obviously, we need to have multiple regions to be able to define how the calling is going to take place. Uh, and once I've identified branch one, you can see the other regions that are available on the system itself. The codec that's going to be used for the call depends on the call manager region configuration. Every device is assigned with a region through their device pool association. Uh, each region we can configure, within each region I should say, we can configure the highest available bandwidth requirement for a region. Uh, and then we can also specify how that is going to be limited to other regions that are listed. Uh, when a call is placed between two different devices, the codec is going to be determined based on the region of the devices, which then is, uh, is, part of their, uh, is part of the device pool configuration. If I come over here and go to uh, device pool, we can uh, find our device pool here, and we have our HQ device pool. And we can see here that we have the ability to specify the region that that device is a member of. The devices will gonna, are going to use uh, basically the best codec that is supported by both of the devices that doesn't exceed the bandwidth requirement of the codec that is permitted for the regions that are actually participating in the call. If the two devices can't agree on a codec, maybe one region is configured to allow G729, as the maximum codec, another region is only going to support G711. Then we need to have a transcoder. A transcoder would be based on the media resource group list if it's available to be able to convert that call from G711 to, G to, to uh, G729. Uh, to conserve IP bandwidth, we use low bandwidth codecs. And we saw that in Discovery 9 that uh, those codecs tend to take a lot less bandwidth over the WAN. All right, in the LAN, we use our high bandwidth codecs for optimal call quality, but also for because we don't simply uh, need all of those, uh, those limiting factors of the codec uh, because the, the, uh, the call doesn't require uh, nearly as much bandwidth as available. All right, now when designing where to use the type of codec, you have to consider that low bandwidth codecs like G729 are designed for human speech. The G729 uh, codec is not going to work at all for audio streams like music on hold and so on. In fact, if you try to stream music on hold using G729, it will be uh, pretty bad, actually. All right. Now we have to go back to our regions here because now we need to create that relationship between the regions that we've configured. So I'm going to go into the branch one region. I'm going to highlight branch one meaning that this is a call from branch one to branch one within the branch itself. And I'm going to go ahead and say, let's go ahead and utilize an uncompressed high quality codec like G722 or G711. All right, we'll save that configuration. So we've now established a relationship between branch one and branch one. So the maximum uh, session uh, bit rate for video calls uh, the maximum set rate, uh, session bit rate for immersive video calls. Uh, let's go ahead and actually set that as well. I forgot to set that. Let's go back to branch one. Uh, and the video calls, we're going to go ahead and set that to 1,000 kilobits a second. And then immersive video calls, we're going to set that to 6,000 kilobits a second. All right. And again, these are numbers that you have to calculate based on what's configured within your environment what you suspect will be adequate to service uh, these calls within the LAN. All right, so now we have this new region relationship listed in our region relationships. Uh, that relationship is between branch one, uh, which we can see in the region information at the top, and branch one, which we see in the region relationship. It defines that any call that's made between two different endpoints within the same region, in this particular case, are going to use an audio codec that's not going to exceed 64 kilobits per second, and a video call will not exceed 1,000 kilobits per second. The immersive video calls will not exceed 6,000 kilobits per second. 
All right. So now we're going to select the HQ. And we're going to say, OK, in this case, we're only going to allow G729 uh, right here, 8 kilobits. Uh, and we'll, do, we'll limit the uh, uh, regular video bandwidth to 384 kilobits a second and with the immersive video bandwidth to 3100 kilobits a second. And again, this would really depend on what you have defined within your environment. All right. So now if I go back to the list, you can see that that relationship has been created in both directions, right? HQ to branch one. But now we need HQ to HQ, and we need to specify that in this case, we're going to use pretty much the same settings that we had for branch to branch, 64 kilobits a second, uh, 1,000 kilobits a second here, and 6,000 kilobits a second here. All right, so we'll save that configuration as well. The only thing, uh, well, there's a few things that are left, but the next step would be to then go ahead and associate these regions to their appropriate device pools. We already have the branch and the HQ device pool specified, so we're going to go into our region information, specify that the devices in this region are going to be part of the um, HQ, uh, device, devices in this device pool are going to be part of the HQ region, and then in branch one, we're going to specify that devices in this device pool are going to be part of the, uh, well, we don't have any devices registered there yet. All right, We're going to be part of the uh, the branch one uh, region. Okay, fairly straightforward. Uh, the next step then would be to associate the endpoints themselves to the device pool. This may have already been done, by the way. Uh, we're going to go ahead and verify that in this particular case. CIPC one uh, is actually not uh, associated. Well, it's not registered. We're going to have to go ahead and uh, uh, fix the name of that. Uh, but the device pool is listed as HQ in for both devices. So let's go ahead and get the, the phone registered here. All right, I paused the video there because I was waiting for those phones to get registered. But now we can see that the phones are registered. They're both registered within HQ uh, as our device pool here. So we're going to go ahead and place a call from uh, uh, phone one to phone two. Uh, so let's just go ahead and dial the call. 11002. We'll go into PC number two. We're going to go ahead and answer that call. All right. And then we're going to hit the question mark. And the question mark will give us uh, a, oops, sorry about that. Should give us an option to see call statistics. Uh, hold on one second. This might be a, a browser issue here. There we go. All right, so here's the call statistics for the call. Uh, we can see that we chose a G722 as the call uh, Kodak. Uh, now, we could choose between 711 and 722. 722 was selected. Uh, it has a slightly higher mean opinion score, and it's a wideband Kodak as opposed to a narrowband Kodak. Uh, we can see that we're, uh, our sample size is 20 milliseconds. Uh, and these are the number of packets that we're sending and receiving. So let's go ahead and end that call. I'm going to go back to call manager now, and I'm going to change CIPC2 into the branch one location. A little bit of a delayed audio there. We keep just seeming to have that going on with this particular lab here. But the call did proceed. So let's go ahead and go into CIPC2 now. Uh, and we're going to change uh, the device pool from HQ to branch one, which then would in turn associate this device to the branch one region. We'll go ahead and reset and restart this phone, soft and hard reset. Uh, I always do both just to be you know, thorough. Uh, we'll go back to our phone list, make sure that the device is registered. All right, uh, so let's refresh that one more time. Device phone. Uh, now the phone is registered, and we're going to go ahead and place another call to that destination. So we're going to redial. We're going to answer this call. And we're going to use the double question mark here. And we can see that we're now using a G729 codec, same sample size, 20 milliseconds uh, per sample. So this was automatically negotiated based on the device pool settings. Let's go ahead and end this call.
Now, uh, regions allowed us to identify what codec was going to be used between the locations. Now we're going to go in and we're going to set up locations. And what locations allow us to do is identify how much bandwidth we can use in total between the different locations. So regions allows us to identify the, uh, the, the specific codec that is allowed between, uh, you know, on each individual call. And then the location settings allow us to identify how much bandwidth we're going to allow total. And this is really how Call Manager implements the call admission control function. Calls are going to be limited by, uh, by permitting a specific amount of bandwidth for all the calls coming in and going out of that, of that particular location. Call Manager actually calculates the actual audio codec bandwidth plus the overhead, uh, and it assumes basically a packetization period of about 20 milliseconds. So each G uh, G711 call is going to reduce the bandwidth that is configured by a location by about 80 kilobits a second. G729 is going to reduce that by about 24 kilobits a second. Each device has uh, one location assigned to it, and that can be done through the device pool or it can be done on the device itself. If both are used, the device configuration is going to always trump the device pool configuration. The configured bandwidth limit is independent of, of the destination location of the call. So unlike the region configuration, where the maximum permitted codec is configured per uh, pair of regions, the bandwidth limitation of a location applies to the interlocation calls regardless of whatever the other location is. All right, we'll see that as part of our configuration. Locations give us the ability to provide call admission control for calls within a single cluster. Uh, because these locations can also be configured as uh, uh, gateways or at least four gateways or four trunks, uh, we're going to allow some call control for calls leaving Call Manager as well. Location-based call admission control in Call Manager is really unaware of what the topology of the network looks like. It's a purely logical assignment. It doesn't actually reflect the topology or the actual bandwidth that's available in your topology. All right, calls within a location do not count towards the location bandwidth limited. Calls within a location are going to be unlimited by default. Uh, and the location-based call emission control algorithm considers only the calls that are actually leaving your particular location. So we're going to go ahead and add a new location. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, create a location called HQ. All right. And uh, the, the, the destination location right now is hub none because that's the only default one that we have. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and uh, save this configuration. All right. The next step would be to go ahead and, and add another location. And this one is going to be called branch one. And then we can establish the relationship between these different locations. In fact, I can go ahead and highlight HQ. I can say I'm going to uh, uh, limit the audio bandwidth to 384 kilobits a second. Uh, I'm going to uh, limit the uh, video bandwidth to 1,000. So basically one call in this particular case. Uh, that's what we had in our region configuration. And uh, our immersive video bandwidth to 6,000. OK? So uh, we're essentially establishing how much bandwidth. Now, depending on the codec that is chosen will depend on actually how many calls can be placed. You have to consider the codec, in this case, G729. G729 is uh, about 23 um, uh, kilobits uh, per call. Uh, actually, it's uh, the um, uh, bandwidth that we had calculated previously was about uh, uh, 25 kilobits a second per call. Um, so we can take that number and we can actually multiply that number and uh, or divide it by the total amount of bandwidth that we've that we've allocated. All right. Um, so let's go back to our list here. There's a couple more things I want to set up here. Go back into HQ. Uh, let's go ahead and specify hub none as well. The relationship with hub none. Uh, because uh, it's important for us uh, 
uh, to establish what's allowed uh, when, when, um, uh, when we're actually communicating to Hub None as well. All right, so let's go ahead and click on Hub None here. And uh, let's set, set up some settings here. We're gonna do unlimited audio bandwidth. Uh, we're gonna do 384. Okay, so it's already uh, set there, but let's go ahead and change the immersive bandwidth. That's gonna always require at least a little bit more bandwidth. We're gonna set that to 1,284 kilobits a second. Now these are somewhat arbitrary numbers that we're selecting here uh, based on the fact that uh, you know we know what our topology looks like. Uh, and um, by the way, hub none would be any kind of location that would be uh, not specified within a specific location. And actually what I think I'm gonna do here is uh, branch one Let's go back to our list here. I wanna go into branch one, and I'm actually gonna change this to a worse value. Uh, we had 384K before. I'm gonna go ahead and set this to 23K uh, because I wanna demonstrate that the call will actually fail uh, because the location uh, bandwidth that's set is below what the codec requires. Uh, well, actually, yeah, with overhead, that's true, all right? So we're gonna go into our device pool um, and we're gonna specify the locations for our device pools now that we have them configured. We'll go into our HQ device pool. We're gonna specify the location. Uh, let's try that again. Go into HQ, specify the location as HQ. All right, and we're gonna go back to our branch location and we're gonna specify this, uh, our branch device pool and specify that that uh, location is uh, branch one. So we got region of branch one, location of branch one. We'll go ahead and reset and restart that device pool. That'll reset the comp, uh, uh, CIPC device in that region, or that uh, device pool, excuse me. All right, so now we would just basically wanna go back and do a test call. All right, uh, we've already reset the phones. Uh, we do need to go into a serviceability. This is a very important concept. If we're going to utilize, uh, uh, you know, this type of call admission control, we have to turn on the CLBM, the Cisco Location Bandwidth Manager. So I'm gonna go to service activation. This is a feature service that gets enabled on the publisher. And uh, it is uh, part of the CM services. Uh, we need to make sure that we have the Cisco Location Bandwidth Manager activated in order for uh, any type of call admission control to be functional within Unify Communications in our Unify Communications platform. All right, so we'll go ahead and activate that service. Okay. Now, again, we're going to need at least 25K of bandwidth for the call to proceed. Uh, and we've only allocated 23K between the locations. So when I go now and I place the call, I should get an indication that there's not enough bandwidth. So 11002, and we can see there, not enough bandwidth. We would actually be hearing the reorder tone as well, indicating that uh, there isn't enough bandwidth. All right, so let's go back to call manager and let's go ahead and change that uh, bandwidth to a higher value. Obviously, you would probably want to set it to something indicative of what you're going to have in your environment. Uh, you know, in, in this case, we're kind of playing around with the, the options here. Uh, so let's go back to our location information, go to locations, and I'm going to go into HQ, and I'm going to specify that to go to branch one. In this case, now I'm going to allow 24 kilobits a second that should be enough. I know I said 25, but 24 should be uh, enough. Let me save that configuration. All right, I should not have to reset anything because the phone is already in the appropriate device pool. And we can see that the uh, call is still not proceeding. All right, let me actually reset this device. Star, star, pound, star, star. And uh, that device should reboot um, but we should have had, uh, well, actually, you know what? It's a little bit more than 24 kilobits a second, isn't it? I mean, if you consider all of the overhead, right? 
it, it is a G729 codec, uh, but we're not quite where we need to be to be able to place the call. So let's make one more change here and let's just make it 28 kilobits a second. And that should be sufficient to support at least one audio call. All right. That's why it's so important to understand the relationship between the codec and the bandwidth because we want to be able to uh, identify how many calls are going to be allowed based on the amount of bandwidth. We can see now that the call is allowed to proceed. All right. Of course, we would want to limit that amount of audio bandwidth or even the, the session bandwidth for our video calls or immersive video calls based on you know, what type of WAN circuit we have. What is the functionality of the WAN circuit? At the busiest time of the day, how much bandwidth is available for these types of calls? Uh, we might still be slicing that data out into, uh, you know, and applying QoS and whatnot, but bandwidth is bandwidth. If there's not enough bandwidth, it doesn't matter what type of quality of service you implement, there's just simply not enough bandwidth. All right, so we'll go ahead and wrap up this discovery and we will see you guys in the summary challenge and then we're going to go into describing uh, our um, uh, dial plans and endpoint addressing.